All right, so I'm not a science teacher, but that's the lesson you're going to get today. Um, I believe that the human trafficking field is filled with hyperbole, and hyperbole does two things. It scares you, and it freezes you. Uh, and most people, when they're in that situation, say, well, I should probably write a check to somebody who knows what they're doing. If money can solve it, it's probably not a problem. Um, it's about your activity, right, engaging the problem. So uh, I believe that practicality is the way to solve this problem. Um, I'm a little bit too practical. Uh, my wife and I have four kids. You can ask any one of them. Uh, practicality is solid. Empathy, eh, not so much. Uh, my children here suck it up more than any other children <laughs> in the world which is only a little bit ironic uh, compared to what we're gonna talk about for a few minutes here. Um, we're gonna talk about the brain today. Uh, as, you, as you heard some of the uh, different comments about psychology, those actually have hard wiring issues going on in your brain. And we're gonna talk about the brain as it relates to victims of trafficking and how their brains are actually hardwired to pursue more trauma. Um, I'm gonna talk about just a few different uh, structures in the brain. One of the things that you won't find in the brain is bootstraps, because your brain is not made with bootstraps, so you cannot, as a victim, pull yourself up by them, okay? So let's start with this. Let's start with the hippocampus. The hippocampus is responsible for short-term memory. Uh, anybody ever worked with someone who uh, was assaulted before and they couldn't quite put things together for you? Okay, the hippocampus is, is necessary to make those short-term memories. So that's the, the first structure I wanna talk about. The second structure is the amygdala. The amygdala up there uh, is the one that looks like a finger, okay? The amygdala is responsible for your fight, flight, and freeze, okay? It's connected to your body, your limbic system, so any trauma that your body receives, your amygdala kicks in and you either run away, you freeze, or you fight. Now, I don't go to haunted houses because my, I don't have uh, freeze or flee, I have fight and I will kill somebody in a haunted house if they jump out and scare me, okay? Y'all can figure out what you are. Um, but that amygdala, for, a, for someone who's been traumatized repeatedly, is overactive. See, our brains develop from the back to the front. So if you hold up your hand like this, imagine that your forearm is your brain stem uh, and this is where your amygdala is in the back. Uh, so if you were to take a baby and they do the startle, don't drop the baby, but they do the startle test in the, in the hospital, right? Where they do this and the baby goes like that, right? Your amygdala already kicking in, right? Fight, flight, and freeze. They're just making sure their body's all right. So our brains develop from the back to the front. So all of that fight, flight, and freeze develops first. Up in the front, in the front of your brain, right up here, is the frontal lobe responsible for executive functioning, rationality, thought, decision making, okay? Um, and we'll get to that just in a minute. But in a traumatized brain, the amygdala develops and then overdevelops so that it is always firing. The last structure I want to talk to you about, we talked about the hippocampus, responsible for short-term memory. The amygdala, responsible for fight, flight, and freeze. And the last one is the hypothalamus, okay? The hypothalamus is respons responsible for triggering your fight, flight, and freeze uh, reaction. It also releases a few different hormones, uh, and one of them shuts down the hippocampus. So that your brain isn't worried about, I need to remember this, your brain isn't worried about, I need to get out of here. One of, uh, uh, releases a few different uh, types of hormones, one of them is cortisol. Cortisol uh, causes depression, cortisol, cortisol causes dissociation, and it kills your immune system over time if you've got too much of it built up in your system. Now, cortisol is, is necessary. So when your brain recognizes something's going wrong, your hypothalamus says, I need to release this, I need to shut down the hippocampus so we can just get going, and it's gonna trigger fight, flight, and freeze so I can get out of here. So, for instance, let's say I walk outside and I get stabbed. Let's, not, let's hope that doesn't happen, right? But I get stabbed in the leg. My, my brain is gonna release cortisol so that my blood thins out and says, you need to go. We don't need to worry about the blood clotting. You just need to get out of here. So it's gonna move a lot of oxygen and I'm gonna run, okay? So in a trafficking victim, what happens, uh, it was when cortisol is released and their immune system is, is beginning to be affected, they're sick more consistently. Any trauma victim, they're sick more consistently, okay? So those are the three I want you to remember and we're gonna tie all these in at the end, okay? The hippocampus, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. 
And the, the hormone I want you to remember is cortisol, okay? Not cortisone, that's a whole different thing, cortisol. So when we talk about trafficking victims, you need to understand that the, the victims of child sexual abuse are numerous, far more numerous than the amount of trafficking victims. People that are telling you that millions of children are being trafficked in the United States are lying to you. Millions of children in the United States are victims of sexual assault. One in six young, young men and one in three young women will be assaulted before they're 18 years old. That's a reality. So we've got all these kids that are victims of sexual, child sexual abuse, and as they go through their life, um, the majority of them, at some point that stops, and it leaves lasting, lasting ramifications. Their brains begin to develop a certain way. But when we start to talk about run running away from home, Leslie talked earlier about she, she ran away from home when she was 15. The number one entryway into commercial sex in America is being a runaway or homeless youth. So as we start to add different types of trauma, as we start to add poverty, the likelihood that someone will be approached or exploited gets higher and higher. So what, what I want to tell you is that um, the majority of people who are trafficking victims were victims of child sexual abuse first. They have also, the majority of them come from a background of poverty. Now if we were to watch 2020 or 60 Minutes, which is just old people MTV, uh, if you're to watch those, the story that you're going to see over and over is a white girl from the burbs that was lured off of, of Facebook by some pimp and trafficked. And that happens about 25-30% of the time. The majority of trafficking victims are children of poverty and children of color. We don't tell that story enough, but that's the reality. So. As we're looking at this population, um, I want you to understand that we talk about trafficking victims having PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Uh, that's true in some cases, but what is more true is that they don't have PTSD, they have CPTSD, complex PTSD. So what happens in PTSD is someone has a, a fairly regular life, and then a traumatic issue, a traumatic event happens and spikes them up right, to dissociated behavior, and they're kind of out there. This is why we see it in soldiers. They see horrible things in war, and of course, even someone who's very strong uh, emotionally can have this, this sort of response. And the goal with someone with PTSD is to bring them back down, right, back down to reality, reconnect. Now, someone, uh, a trafficking victim, the majority of trafficking victims that we work with at the Manassa Project have complex PTSD, which means there was no pre-traumatic life for them. Since go, since they can remember, since their brain was developing, they have been neglected and abused in one form or another. So their brain is constantly scanning for uh, some sort of threat. Their amygdala is overactive. Now, you might say, oh, okay, so what? Here's the problem. The brain on the, this is a study done by Harvard, uh, the brain on the left here is what I hope your brain looks like, and actually more so I hope my brain looks like that. Where is most of the activity? It's in the front, right? The frontal cortex, executive decision and, and, and uh, choices, rationality, all of that. Essentially, the brain on the left has gas and brakes. So, Somebody were to stand up right now, make a comment about my mother, I might be angry and want to deck you, but I can rationalize through it. They're having a bad day. It's cool. Or maybe I don't want to catch a case, right? There's a whole bunch of different reasons. <laughs> and I just let it go. It takes me three seconds, right? What you'll also notice is all this yellow and all this green, these are neural pathways and neurotransmitters, right? Um, these are firing, the synopses are firing. You can bring information from the back of your head to the front. So, if there was a, a mic cable laying on the ground, my well-developed brain glances over and sees it and thinks, mic cable. If the front of my brain isn't developed, I could glance over there and think, snake, right? Because I'm constantly looking for a threat. The brain on the right is a traumatized brain. These brains are the same age. 
One has been severely traumatized and one has not. And when I say traumatized, I mean it's not that they're getting beaten in the head. I mean they're, they've been abused throughout their life and their brain has developed to where most of the activity is in the back. They are constantly scanning for danger. The front of their brain is underdeveloped. So when they're triggered, when they sense a threat, when they go into fight, flight, and freeze, there ain't no coming back for a while. I can get ticked off and get really angry for like two, three minutes. After that, I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And I bring myself back down. I have that ability. This brain does not. I use the word ability on purpose. It is not that this child does not want to do well. When you ask a kid what they want to be when they grow up, it's a lawyer, a doctor in the NFL or the NHL in my case. Right? That we want to be great things. You don't hear, I want to be a stripper. You don't hear, I want to be a pimp. Right? They want to do well. Every child wants to do well. Even the ones that are giving you a hard time want to do well. The brain on the right literally cannot. It is as if uh, they have a fire alarm strapped to the back of their head that's going off all the time. So let me give you this example. Um, if I were to put headphones on each one of you and pick a music that you hate, and I put it on in, that, in those headphones and turn it up all the way to 10 or 11 if we're watching Spinal Tap, and I just let that ring in your ears all day long, and I said, just go to work. Talk to your kids. Have a conversation. Most of you would struggle because there's constant something going on. You'd be looking over your shoulder because you can't hear people coming. Could you talk on the phone? Could you type? Could you concentrate to read? No, 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 you couldn't. That's the brain on the right. Now, good news, bad news. The brain on the right will never be the brain on the left. Won't happen. Okay? The brain on the right is a 10 on the Richter scale, right? And the brain on the, on the left is a 1, right? Calm, peaceful. Now, if I believed that there would be no change, I would not do this work. Uh, but I am a profoundly hopeful person in as much as I am pragmatic. The brain on the right may never be the brain on the left, but imagine if I took those headphones and I put them back on you after days and days of it blasting in your ears on 10 and I turned it down to a three. What could you get done? Could you focus more? Could you have a conversation? Does everything seem so amped up? No. That brain on the right can develop over time. So what we're talking about when we're, when we're rehabilitating uh, victims of human trafficking, victims of commercial sexual exploitation of children, is skill building and empowerment. Right? And that doesn't happen if the people who are trying to help them believe that they just don't want to do well. So this is largely our problem. We have to stop using words like prostitute. There is no such thing as a, pro a child prostitute. It doesn't exist. Though in Michigan, children at 16 and 17 can be charged with prostitution, we should cry out and say, that is not true. There is no such thing as a child prostitute. Right? Exploited. Change the way we talk about things. Language is so powerful. Think about the way... <laughs> We talked 50 years ago about women, about people of color. Now, are we there yet? No, right? We may have seen the mountaintop, but we have not crossed over, right? There's so much work to be done. But when we change the way we talk, out of the mouth comes the abundance of the heart, right? If I'm saying prostitute, I believe it. The other part is, if I'm saying the word prostitute, even if I love this child, I'm standing in a courtroom, I'm advocating for this child, and I say this child has a history of running away, prostitution, and she's got some, or he, has some drug addictions. All those are ringing, ringing all sorts of red flags off in that judge's head. Prostitution's a crime. Being a minor in possession is a crime. Running away is a crime. What do we do with crime in Michigan? Punish it. You cannot punish the right brain into being the left brain. You can get compliance, but you will not get change unless you work on skill building repeatedly over and over and over. Sometimes it's something small, brushing your teeth, hygiene, getting up for school on time, 
getting a job, all those sorts of things. But it's got to be in an environment where you're holding accountable, but you're understanding how the brain is functioning at the same time. See, we want to push survivors to tell their stories. Why? Because we all love to look at a car accident. Let me just say, it is none of our business what happened to them. Our job is to respond faithfully to the human in front of us. Not to, not to be a rubbernecker and keep turning our head to look at the accident. And here's part of the problem. Part of this brain trauma is that our left brain has explicit memory. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Why do I know that? Because Miss B made me memorize it in second grade. My left brain stores all that kind of stuff I learned in school, whether I learned, wanted to learn it or not. And it has language. I can tell you when Columbus sailed the ocean blue and butchered a bunch of people, but that's a different story. My right brain holds all those implicit memories, the trauma. It's locked up in there, and it has no language. So when we are trying to force people to tell their story, understand that in a traumatized brain, the two sides of the brain do not communicate well. It may not be that they don't want to tell you the story. Again, it may, not, it may be that they cannot at that point. So when we are uh, working with young women and young men to help them to tell their stories, the best thing you can do is get them active. Release that dopamine. Reduce the cortisol. Get kids active. High risk endeavors. Look, the life they led was high risk. They can certainly stand for some high ropes courses, okay? Might be scary, but that's a natural release. If they don't get that natural release of dopamine in that way, and they can't get a drug of choice, whatever that drug may be, they will get a dopamine release, which is what makes us feel good and actually what it causes addiction, looking for that dopamine high. They will get it by fighting you, because it's always fight, fun to fight the adults. It's not about locking them in. It's not about forcing them to do anything. It's not about making them tell their story. Skill building and empowerment. You are beautiful, you are loved, and you are capable. Let's find your dream and pursue it. This is how we respond to victims. Not parading them out in front of people, not forcing a lifestyle upon them. The average recidivism rate for a trafficking victim is six to eight times to go back to their pimp, which mirrors our domestic violence cycle, six to eight times going back to your pimp, which mirrors a young woman running away from home six to eight times going back to the person that would abuse them. Be patient. There's no condemnation. There's no judgment. You go back, you go back. You come back to us, let's walk through how it happened. What were the triggers that sent you back? Because let me tell you something. They feel affection and love, as well as fear, from the pimp. You will get nowhere bad-mouthing that guy or woman. Nowhere. They'll defend him just like a domestic violence uh, victim will defend their abusive partner. They get acceptance there. If they cannot get it with you, if they cannot get it with me, then they will go back. If they don't have the skill set to survive, they will go back to what they know because child sexual abuse becomes on-the-job training. If you have no other skills but you know your value is sexual, you go back to what you know. So as you're thinking about how you engage victims, you have to do it holistically. You have to understand that, yes, the brain will develop, but it is going to take time, and it is going to frustrate you to no end. Understand, you are just as frustrated as they are. In fact, probably less, because they also, in addition to after dealing with their own trauma, they got to deal with you. <laughs> and me. Ask any of the kids I work with, and they will tack on me onto that list. Empathy. Repetition, skill building, empowerment. You need to be involved in that. Maybe not one on one. Maybe it doesn't work for you. Maybe you're not, maybe you're like me and you're not empathetic, where it doesn't work for you to work one on one with someone. Then be preventative. 
stop a buyer before they come become a buyer. Nobody wakes up and says, uh, today I'm going to be a prostitute. Nobody wakes up and says, today I'm going to go buy somebody. You have a role in each one of these areas. So go do it. Moses was walking through the wilderness, and there's a burning bush. Not that that was ter- like really strange for him in his time. Lots of bushes were on fire. It was the desert, right? What's different is that he noticed the bush did not consume, and he left his path to go see it. Today, I'm inviting you to understand that every bush is on fire. Thank you.